that's lined. We're all lined up at this okay. point. Okay. Well, we're sitting here with Gary Guyerson in his home in Port Republic. Gary Guyerson, longtime mayor of Port Republic, to hear a disquisition on cedar. Beautiful. Gary has made the claim that he can speak longer on cedar than we want to hear, and I challenged him on that claim. So, Samantha, Rachel, Rory, and Tom want to see whether Gary can, in fact, tire us out on the topic of cedar. We don't believe he can. How much tape you got in that there uh, camera? 57 hours. Okay. Well, I don't <laughs> think we can do that. Okay. Fire away. Tell us about cedar. Okay. Atlantic white cedar. Atlantic white cedar is a, a really a unique tree. It... Uh, it was the first industry of this area in South Jersey because it was so tied to shipbuilding. And of course, in early days, everything is moved by ship. It's too slow to move it by wagon, you know, uh, on, on roads that aren't there yet. And so everything is depending on shipping. When they sailed up the Mullica River, they found this beautiful thing called an estuary. An estuary is a plot of land or a, or a, or a plot of water where the fresh water coming out of the lakes and streams from these cedar swamps, it starts at the roots of these cedar trees and all comes down. You've got Lake Apsigami, Lake Oswego. There's another lake that I've forgotten the name of, but they're all contributors to the Mullica River, Bass River also. And all of these areas that, that produce this beautiful, fresh, clean water that looks like root beer. It has a unique color to it, and it's because of the tannic acid that's in the sap that literally changes the color of this water. And it has no medicinal purpose that I know of, or, but I've drank a lot of it because it's, uh, it's always nice and cold. It's usually 42 degrees coming out of the ground. So in the wintertime, wherever, wherever this spring is, if you have a snowstorm, You'll see the snow all around, but this spring never freezes over. It never ices over because it's 42 degrees. As it moves down the stream, the stream freezes over. But where that spring is, and it's very dangerous when you're ice skating on a pond that's been an old cedar swamp where there are springs, that ice is very, very thin in that area. It'll show as, as a white color where the spring is. So you never want to do that. So, so we're, we're into the estuary. Fresh water meets the tide water coming in from the ocean, the bay, to the river, to the creeks, to the streams, to the ponds. And where this mixture is of fresh water and salt water, that's where you have this estuary system. And that's where this unbelievable tree grows. This tree grows from the, from the, state, uh, from the states of uh, Maine to Florida. But there's a uniqueness about this tree and you won't find this in any book that I know of because I've tried to read up on as much cedar as I can. And I, I've, I've come to this conclusion. I've heard boat builders and I've heard carvers and <laughs> very famous people tell me there's no Atlantic cedar like the cedar from South Jersey. And I believe it's because of the climate changes from Maine to Florida. In Maine, where this tree grows, you've got cold, cold winters, and you've got trees that have a very, very narrow uh, amount of pulp in them. You've got, if you look at the growth ring, if you slice a tree, the whole history of the tree is in that, in, is in those growth rings. You can tell when the winter was cold or when it was, was, was not. And what you have in Maine, the growth rings are very, very tight together. And there's only a little bit of pulp between, between the growth ring, the sap. There's sap lines, sap ring. That's where the life goes up into the tree. So what happens when you get down to Florida or you go, you go south of uh, South Jersey, the growth rings, because the tree can grow faster, now you have more pulp than, than rosin or sap. You know, we'll call this sap, but it's really like a rosin. It'll harden and crystallize. And uh, so when this happens, 
the trees in South Jersey were the finest cedar for building boats. Because they, it was right in the middle? Right in the middle. Okay. Because we're the growth the, the growth rings on the Atlantic White Cedars in South Jersey, in South Jersey in particular, South Jersey is really unique. Because of the Appalachian Mountains, we are in a climate zone. Uh, it goes right across Freehold almost. Uh, that 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 South Jersey is always warmer than North Jersey, mm-hmm. and I believe yeah. it's because of the Appalachian Mountains and prevailing wind from the west. You know, the prevailing wind comes over there due to the rotation of the earth. I'm just getting like a professor here now. Sounds great. But anyway, let's get back to cedar. So we've, we've got cedar growing from Maine to Florida, but the best is in South Jersey. It, it, it is so unique. I, uh, I've been involved with it all my life. Uh, we had... Uh, Port Republic is a, a unique example of a shipbuilding town. Our history goes back to, uh, my family history itself goes back to 1637, and my family were Dutch shipbuilders and sawyers. And when they came to the Mullica River and found this beautiful, unbelievable tree, and and I, I had, I'm get, kind of getting ahead of myself, why cedar is so beautiful and good for boat building. The swamps grow extremely tight and close together. This is due to when the swamp first storm first forms, those all those little blue seed pods that are on the or, or on the one species of sex of the tree, when they fall to the ground, they they seed themselves and little cedar seedlings will come up two or three inches high. In a year they'll grow to twelve inches high. But then after that first twelve inches, then a lot depends on climate. The growth of this tree. So they're a slow growing tree. There's evidence that this tree once grew to a diameter of five to eight foot in diameter. That's as much as those two tables put together. That's how big these trees were. There, the, there's evidence of these because the stumps and the hawks of them are buried beneath six foot of meadow mud up these creeks along the Mullica River. If you could go up there on a blowout tide, which you can't do only with a kayak or a canoe, and get close enough to them, you can see how huge these trees were. What we had was an East Coast sequoia. Now, any tree that's that big in diameter had to be at least 180, 200 feet tall. Hmm. So you've got an unbelievable tree mm-hmm. here. And you can imagine, in this, it, as, this, as the swamp expands, the tree it, it drops its seedling and all these little things are coming up. Here's the here's the mature trees in the center. But what happens when all these little trees start growing up? They take the sunlight away from the center trees, so the center trees grow straight and tall. There's there's no limb growth. The the I, I tell people cedar grows in the center of a swamp like a stalk of celery. All the limb growth is on the top one-third portion of the tree. So you've got two-thirds of the tree that's limbless. No limbs, no knots. You've got really beautiful, clean boards. And one shaved and sawed and lumbered, you know, and it's it just beautiful for boat building. They also found that this cedar, when they, when they plank boats with it, and they had the white oak here uh, to, uh, to steam bend the ribs, you know, we had plenty of white oak, we even had chestnut trees here, believe it or not. That chestnut tree's got a blight and all passed away. That's why it's called chestnut neck. There was beautiful chestnut trees mm-hmm. down there. Mm-hmm. But anyway, they, so so this 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 tree was so beautiful, and all, all these all the shipbuilding areas start in this in this area. At one time in Port Republic, in the night by the 1940s, before World War II, there were three sawmills in Port Republic. There were four sawmills in New Gretna. And guess what? There was a sawmill at Stockton State College. Mm-hmm. That's why it's called the Sawmill Ponds. And that sawmill was there to log and cut cedar, mostly for boat building. When you go into the, when you go into the swamp to, uh, to harvest these trees, and there's, not the, there's only one standing tree in New Jersey that I know of that's a mature tree that never got cut down. And it's somewhere in New Gretna. Hmm. And I hope your students can, can investigate and find that tree. Because it's, it's supposedly four and a half or five foot in diameter. Wow. 
So it's a big one. Mm-hmm. And, and what happens to that tree, because it had no growth around it, and it was just, I don't know, it might have been somebody's backyard, and they thought it was pretty or something. They didn't cut it down. But what happens, what, the limbs come out on the bottom, so it looks like a red cedar tree. Upland cedars are red cedars. Mm-hmm. That's a whole different uh, family of cedar. But it's all juniper. They're all members of the juniper family. It's the red cedar that has the... the beautiful scent, smell. The beautiful yes, smell. Yes, yeah. very unique. They mm-hmm. line closets with it. Right, right. Uh, when I worked at Smithville, I used to take a limb and slice it and drill a hole in it and put it around a leather uh, shoelace. And I sold as mosquito keeper wares. Okay. And I got a dollar piece for it. Mm-hmm. Or you could rent one mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and bring it back. And nobody ever turned them in. They mm-hmm. kept their sk- skeeter keepers aware. It's, but red cedar is a beautiful tree. It is hard as a rock. It's amazing. It's a hardwood where cedar is a softwood. So here we are. We're in the estuary. We got the, we got the evidence of these trees. So as the swamp expands, and they'll usually expand to the west, because prevailing wind pushes the seed pods or down a stream or, or away from the swamp. So they'll usually, not always, but usually they'll, they'll always uh, mature to, to the west. So what happens when you go in there to harvest these trees, you want them great big beautiful trees in the, in the center of the swamp because they were fit for garvey size. And these trees are growing six feet apart. And, and and between them, and they grow up on a hump like this because the root system pushes the tree up. And it, they were very, very hard to do. And this this is a period of time before Homolite came out with a chainsaw. The first chainsaw was invented by, or made by Homolite, commercial okay. one. And it weighed about 85 pounds. Mm-hmm. It was mm-hmm. a monster. But my father chopped all these trees down. We'll get into the sawmill and the swamp later. But I'll try to stay on course here because I get wandering. So the growth, the growth, we got the big trees in the middle. So what happened when you come in to cut the swamp off, you started at the edge of the swamp and you cut down the little trees like this. They made beautiful lima bean poles. You know what pole limas are? Mm -hmm. If you're in South Jersey, you know what pole limas Mm -hmm. are. Succotash, corn and lima beans don't come any better with fresh butter on it. But anyway, fresh, getting tasty now. But anyway, so <laughs> then you got the, the little pole beans, and then you get in, and you got a three-inch log, a three-inch tree. They were cut down for fence posts, and then you get into a six or eight-inch tree, and this could be made into cedar shingles. There's a hmm. big, big uh, demand for cedar shingles. Yeah. Asphalt's not invented yet. Right. So, so there, and then you get into a tree this big. And this is your weatherboard tree, cedar weatherboards. And then you get into this, you finally get into this tree, and there's garby sides. So the trees would not fall. You couldn't go into the middle because the swamp is so, because they would entangle and, and tie themselves up. So you had to cut the perimeter of the swamp off to get the big ones on the ground. They were good for shingles because they didn't rot? They did not rot. They're impervious. Uh, they're impervious to rot. The, the only thing that's, that's hard on cedar is sunlight. You, you, you take the, the south side of a barn where it's got direct sunlight all year round, you'll see those, those shingles are weathered really hard. Hmm. Uh, the grain raises, the, mm-hmm. the wood pulp, the wood pulp is worn away, but the grains, the, the sap lines stay there. So you've got sap, sap, grain, sap grain, sap grain. So you see this, but on the north side, they'll, they'll, sometimes they'll moss over. They'll, they'll literally get moss on them, and they left the moss on them because the moss didn't hurt them, you know. But it, it, it was amazing. Cedar roofs would last, uh, I would say, 25 to 30 years before you had to replace them. So, and the only thing available was, you know, the, the cedar shingles. Mm-hmm. And uh, in California, they used the redwoods. You know, they had redwood shingles and a lot. But California's not even settled yet, or people aren't across the Ohio River yet. You know, so that so there's a, a there's a tremendous amount 
of need to harvest Atlantic white cedar. Boat building, shingles, weatherboards, fence posts for farms. Everybody had to have fence posts. And they were also used for piling around docks. There were pilings that were that were put into the water. Sometimes they never even took the bark off of them. So, but the bark will fall off the top of the piling. They put them down top first, which is really bad because the tree is tapered like this. And when the ice gets around them, really tight, and the tide comes up and, and pulls the ice, that pulls the piling out of the mm. out of the ground. So you see piling that are raised. That's because the ice has lifted them. Mm. But when those, if you pull a piling out that was put down with bark on it out of the mud, that bark will still be on that tree. And underneath that bark is this smooth, shiny white surface that nothing's ever deteriorated. Cedar is impervious to rot underwater. You can imagine what that meant for, for, uh, for weather and for shipbuilding. So we've got a great demand for it. Mm-hmm. And you've got cedar sawmills grow up wherever there's a swamp. And believe me, along the Mullica River and along the Great Egg Harbor River, you got plenty of cedar swamps. This house wouldn't be here. This farm wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that cedar tree. As a young boy, I go into the swamp. We had a sawmill right down the road. I'm going to get some pictures and send over to Tom of the old Great. sawmill. Great. You, you have to be careful going in there to take pictures of it because there's something extremely valuable in this old sawmill. There's this, this sawmill was run by a single cylinder stationary engine. It's called a make and break engine where they only, they, they have a governor on them and the governor uh, says how much fuel it gets and how much spark it gets. And this great big piston, the piston was this big around. The flywheels were six foot high. And to start this, you jumped on the spoke and, and got the flag, the, the, got the thing turning. And then you went up and you pushed the igniter on. And it could be run by a little battery that big, the, the igniter. And it didn't even need a big car battery. And you, you, you put the igniter on and you opened the gasoline a little bit. And you got water going into the motor from a pitcher pump that's pumping water into an oak barrel. And the oak barrel comes down with a contraption that's putting the water back through the motor. And when you start the motor, there's water running out of the head gasket. That It's dripping water or sometimes even streaming water mm-hmm. because that head gasket is going to expand with heat. Mm-hmm. We ain't got tolerances yet mm-hmm. with steel on it. Mm-hmm. It's mostly iron, you know. Mm-hmm. So we're talking iron against iron. And so this engine's... It, this engine fires, and it's got a four-inch exhaust on it like that, a great big pipe. And, of course, around a sawmill, fire is extremely, fire control mm-hmm. is extremely important. Sure. So there's rain barrels at every corner. There's makeshift uh, little deed troughs at the, at the edges of all the roofs, and at those, those edges, there's always a, a, a barrel there. And the barrel usually has an oak, an oak, uh, uh, it looks like a great big stirring stick, but it's actually oak. And if there's ice on that barrel, you can take that and break it loose or pull the thing up and the ice will come off the top. So you always these rain barrels always had a stick in them to take the ice hmm. in case you needed water wonder with ice because you, they, they milled all year round. If you went into a cedar swamp and cut in the summertime, which was really, really hard to do, because the humidity in these swamps is unbelievable. There's, no, there's hardly any sunlight that ever touches the floor. So in a cedar swamp, all you have is a mound of dirt and a tree, a mound of dirt and a tree, and sphangum moss, which that's a whole other thing. I'll talk about moss in some day, okay. too. Bring some more kids and we'll talk moss. But anyway, it, it's a South Jersey industry. So what happens... There's, there's no sunlight gets on there, so everything is, and it's just so hot and mucky in the summertime. You just peel your clothes off. You take a great big gallon jug of water with you, you know, and as you're working in the swamp. Okay, so here we are. We're in the swamp, and my father's got this Kelly axe. A Kelly axe. I got to use Kelly because Kelly made the best axes. They were, they were, they were great axes. Kelly axe. He's got this Kelly axe, and it's a single blade axe. My father would never, ever touch a double-bladed axe, you know, that has blades on it. Why not? 
Dangerous. Okay. Dangerous. Okay. You, when you when you set a Kelly axe down, you you can you can put it into the spangle moss and walk by it. If you took a double bladed knife, you set it down and you're walking and running, and you're pulling with ropes and you're running around, you're going to step on that axe. Mm -hmm. So that was one reason. So he's there chopping with a Kelly axe, and the tree is like this, and you cut a V like this. First of all, you look and see which way the wind's blowing because the wind is going to help you take this tree mm -hmm. down in the right direction you want it to fall. So you start cutting on the on the windward side, and depending on where you start cutting, where this tree is going to fall. It's going to fall there, it's going to fall there, it's going to fall there. So you start cutting here, and you get halfway through, and then you go around to the other side, and you chop from this side, and you cut in to meet it. So the tree, when it's fallen, it looks, it's cut like this, and the stump looks like this. And of course, the area that's gone was great big wood chips. The, the wood chips from that Kelly axe were six or eight inches long, sometimes two inches thick. I mean, that my father my father only weighed about 140, 150 pounds, and he had men working for him cutting. No one could chop like my father. Mm -hmm. He was amazing. He could put that tree. He'd put a stick in the ground. He was so proud of where he could. He'd put a stick in the ground and fall that tree on his stick. But one time. I'll never forget, we were cutting cedar someplace, and my brother and I are watching him, and there was a wind shift or something, I don't know, but that tree fell 40, 45 degrees off of where he wanted it to go, and it came right at my brother and I. <laughs> Luckily, we had enough warning, because when that tree, when the, 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 they literally scream and cry, it's an amazing thing when you chop a tree down, especially Atlantic white cedar. This thing's like 70 feet tall, and it's this big around. And it's, w before it hits the ground, it goes, Rah! it just makes this great big scream. It'll make your hair curl. But anyway, it was always a good sound because that meant the tree was down. Mm -hmm. And now, and now the work starts. So the tree is down in the swamp. So here's my mother and my brother and I. She's got a plum axe. A plum axe is a beautiful little axe. They were lighter than the Kelly axe, and they had a shorter handle on them, and we would start trimming the tree. And we trim all the limbs off up to about where you could get one fence post out of the top of the tree, and that would be full of knots. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't a real good. So here comes my father. With the, on the Kelly axe handle, he had a two-foot mark. Uh, from the end of the axe handle, two foot, he had a notch in the axe. And he would take that and use it like an inchworm. Two, four, six, eight, ten. And then he'd take the axe and he'd cut a little notch. And that's where the, that was the first log. And then he'd go two, four, six, eight, and he'd make a notch. And that was the second log. So after the tree is all limbed and all pop scutter notched out, we here we, here we run with Grandpa with a two-man saw. The two-man saw, it's got a great big handle on both ends and it's sort of shaped like this. A two-man saw, when you're cutting with a two-man saw, you can't push it. If you push it, it'll bind. So, Grandpa would always, once in a while, he wouldn't pull to see if we were pushing. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd just let his hands off of it and if, if we were pushing, he would really holler at us. So here we are, we're sawing those trees and now you got a nice straight cut. You're not wasting too much wood. So that, Okay, now the logs are laying there, cut to length. So now we go get the truck. The truck is a 1929 Chevrolet flatbed. And it had a six-cylinder engine, you know, the old, what they call the snowball engine. And it had a real low transmission in it, so it would just crawl. So it had a lot of power and all. So Daddy, Pop, he would climb up on the, on the truck, and he'd reach up to, a, to an old cedar or an oak tree, and he'd put a sling around it. And he'd, and he'd hook up a gate block. A gate block would go into the into the sling like that, and then the gate block would open. It would open up like that so you could put the fall line, this line that we're gonna call a fall line, put the fall line in it and close the gate block. Now you take that end and you run it back into the woods. And usually when they saw the tree, they would somehow use can hooks or something like that and get the one end that you were gonna attach a rope to off the ground. 
And so all you had to do was take that three quarter inch manila hemp rope, wrap it around, and then make a timber hitch. And a, even a small child like me could tie a timber hitch. And I'd tie the timber hitch and I'd say, Haul her out, Daddy, you know. And mm -hmm. He'd put the other end onto the truck, you know, and pull the logs out. And that's how that was that was how the, they were taken out of the swamp. And then when the huge logs were cut for garvey sides, which always had an order for garvey sides, we had a mill that had a very long carriage and a very long, large log bank where we could roll longer trees off and the carriage was long enough to accept these longer logs so they could be sliced into uh, garvey sides, one piece sides for the whole side of a garvey, which was the number one work boat. When you drove a car from uh, Tom's River to Cape May on Old Route 9, about every fourth house would have a garvey alongside the house. Mm. They made their living by the bay or clamming or whatever, you know, and fishing, netting rockfish was legal then. We won't get into that one. But anyway, we, uh, w we would bring the, load the truck up and those great big long logs uh, would be put on the truck so that they would actually go by the cab and the butts would set on the fenders of the cab of the truck, the front fenders, so you can imagine how long they are. Sometimes they were 26 foot long because hmm. 26 foot was an actual length of a lot of garbies. So, so we would bring them home, you know, and load the other logs in the middle. And, and it was always so much fun to ride home on the top of a load of logs because it showed that that uh, it was hard work and mm -hmm. harvesting and also we're sitting on a hell of a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and to have a sawmill, you know, and, and uh, have the property and have the swamps. My grandfather, he, w he would go to these people and buy their swamps and he would get a quick claim deed, you know, to go in there and we would harvest the cedar off of it and he'd never pay a cent of taxes on it. And he just let it go for taxes, you know, because he had a quick claim deed. And so he, this, this I remember Mrs. Anderson, she lived right in back of Smithville on Great Creek Road. Or no, Moss Mill Road, where it comes into Smithville. Mrs. Anderson, I went with Grandpa. He's got $100 bills in one pocket and $50 bills in another pocket, in his shirt pocket. And he says, oh, Mrs. Anderson, I'm so sorry to hear about your husband dying. He said, uh, you know, he was really good. He said, uh, you know... Uh, he never wanted to sell me the cedar, never wanted to sell the swamp to me. He said, I really need it. I got a lot of orders for cedar, you know, and, and uh, oh, no, Lon, I couldn't do that. I I couldn't go across what my, uh, my, my husband wanted to save that swamp. He said, never sell that swamp. Well, Grandpa would reach in and he'd take out a $50 bill and he'd fold it in half like a tent and snap it and put it on that metal kitchen table. And that winter woman's eyes would get real big. And Grandpa would say, well, Ms. Anderson, uh, you know, uh, taxes are due, aren't they? Oh, yeah, Lon, the taxes are due. And he'd reach into the other pocket, he'd pull out a $100 bill this time, fold it like a little tent, snap it, and lay it on down beside it. And, of course, and this, she finally says, Lon, how many pockets are you going to get into before you buy my swamp? And he had to say, well, my pockets are empty or that's it, you know. Mm -hmm. And he always ended up getting the swamp from the widow woman. Mm -hmm. So Grandpa would go buy the swamps, and we would go go cut them on weekends because my father was a radio engineer. He built two-way radios for the New Jersey Fire Fire Service in all the trucks and cars and and uh, office headquarters and everything. They had two-way radio uh, a little bit, a tiny bit before the New Jersey State Police had two-way radios. Okay. So my father's building all these radios, you know, and he's building them on the dining room table in there. And the house is always full of solder smoke and, you know, and you know how kids always want to emulate what their daddy's doing? I would take a cigar box and I would take a, an awl and I'd punch holes in it and I'd get a, a, a vacuum tube and I'd put it in the holes. And then I'd go in his junk pile where he's throwing this thing away. And I would put that alongside it. That would be like a transformer or something, you know. And I built little radio sets out on cigar boxes with mm -hmm. all these junk parts. It's amazing. I have an unbelievable memory. I've been blessed with a memory. I just wrote a short story about my first day of school. 
from combing my hair. My brother hollering, the bus is coming, the bus is coming, to coming home and my mother asking me, what kind of a day did you have? My whole first day of school, I just wrote the whole thing. It's in my mind. And I have this unbelievable memory that's just really great. But we're here not, not talking about me or my memory. We're talking about cedar trees. Where are we? We're, we're taking this, the, the cedars out and, and to the sawmill. And we got this great big old big stationary engine, this auto engine. And my father's got the pitcher pump working and the water's running and pouring out on the ground around the head. And now he jumps on the thing and, and, and pulls the wheel. And she goes, ka -chuff, ka -chuff, you know, and then he goes up and puts a spark on it. And, and find, now now he's got the wheels running where he don't have to jump on them anymore. He can just go like this and pull on them because once you get a flywheel working, they're really, you know, it's it's called, it's a momentum builder, motion builder. So he's pulling on this and then he goes up and puts the gas on and kapow, this old thing goes kapow. She fires and now those wheels just start spinning. Now there's a governor up on top of the thing, these little little steel balls that go out. And they got a thing around these things. And when the steel balls go out, that shuts off the fuel. That shuts off the fuel so she, she don't fire anymore. So when she when these little steel balls are like this, she's going kapow, 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 kapow. And these are working their way out. And then they, they hit this hit the sides and she don't fire and she goes, kapow, kapow, kalalop, 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 kapow, kalalop, kalalop, kapow, kapow, kalalop, kalalop, kalalop. The noise that this makes is unbelievable. It's a great big thing. And to hear that sawmill start up was just, mm -hmm. it was amazing. If we were doing something, playing around the house, and the mill was right across the pasture field there. And to hear that, we always come a-running because we'd love to be around the sawmill. It's a dangerous thing with the, with saws and everything. And the mill was set up where we could, we could cut shingles and we cut weatherboards and everything. So it was a full-service full service mill. And uh, it was, everything was uh, all about cedar, you know, until... World War II, and then when World War II ends in the early 1950s, uh, Eisenhower is elected president, and he's got this unbelievable program where he's he built all those super highways, and they had to have a mile straight away where planes could land on them. This is all the all the I-95s mm -hmm. and the, and all those roads that crisscross America, but also what happened was a, a building boom. All these vets coming home from World War II needed homes. They had married some married uh, girls from France and England and Italy and br brought their wives home and got or got married when they got home and had them houses. So the housing boom was unbelievable. Uh, from 1953 to uh, 1960 was just a housing boom, and of course then uh, the Cedars replaced. Uh, fiberglass is invented. When we saw a fiberglass boat, we would get so mad. We'd say, there goes a bleach bottle. We called them bleach bottles, mm -hmm. you know, because they were plastic. Bleach bottles. But the bleach bottles today, I got one sitting in the backyard now. But anyway, it's uh, the cedar had its era, and it had its time. And it was uh, it was so rewarding to the people who live live in this area along the Mullica or any river, especially the Mullica. The Mullica is one of the cleanest rivers in the country. It's the cleanest river on the East Coast. And when you start uh, imagining uh, the rivers on the West Coast and they, they claim it's one of the cleanest rivers, it's 50 miles long from the headwaters all the way up to Ad Zion. You know where Ad Zion Lake is? up on 206, mm -hmm. when you're going north up 206, which, which was the main north-south highway uh, in Jersey before the parkway, 206 goes right through Ad Zion. Well, Ad Zion Lake is the headwater of the Mullica River. On one side of the road is the lake, on the other side of the road is the Mullica. And its tributaries uh, that, fed the, that fed Lake Ad Zion, I took a canoe, I had a small a small old town canoe, it was a 10 footer. And I didn't have any GPS or anything like that. I wish I would have, because what, what I wanted to show was if you went to the headwaters of Ad Zion Lake from the Mullica River, how far west you could get and, 
and Rancocas Creek coming in from, from the Delaware River, how close they were. Hmm. Like it was a very short trip for Indians and stuff to use the mulch. There's evidence that the Lenape Lenapes were all over and they were great fishermen. Uh, they, they were very close to the Indians from Virginia, which were called Nanticooks. Nanticooks. Say Nanticook. Nanticook. Say Nanticook. Nanticook. Loud. Nanticook. Nanticook. Yes. Nanticook. Say Lenape Lenape. Lenape Lenape. Loud. Lenape Lenape. That's it. Lenape Lenape and Nanticook. That's the two Indians that were in this area. And if you go out here in this field after every rain, I guarantee you, you can pick up a stone tool. Hmm. There was something here. Something here. Because it's proximity to the river and everything. It's amazing, this property. Now, when when families when families uh, families are formed, the eldest son gets everything. They get all the land and everything. The other brothers and stuff, they might get this or get that, but the eldest son's got the land. Well, my father was an eldest son. His father was an eldest son. His father was an eldest son. And his father was an eldest son. So I'm an eldest son. My brother and I, we share, we pay taxes on 6,800 acres still to this day. Most of it is all meadow land on both sides of the Malka River. We own all the way up to almost to the water tower at, uh, at uh, Lower Bank. Hmm. It's amazing. The property, the land that, that was given to these the older sons, you know, it's just amazing. So I'm, I'm, I'm just blessed that I'm an older son. But I have three daughters and I don't have anybody to pass it down to. But I sent them off to Christian colleges and they met Christian husbands and I got little grandchildren to run around saying Bible verses. Nothing wrong with that, is it? So back on Cedar. Gary, let me ask you yes, this. Yes. You, you, you said earlier something about um, differences between cedar north of the Mullica, south yes. of the Mullica? Yes. Uh, north of the Mullica, it's known as bog cedar. There's more iron deposits on the north side of the Mullica River. And what happens when that, 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 that tannic acid helps, helps all these, the, the iron iron form in the ground there's veins of iron in the ground and it turns into sandstone jersey sandstone on your way out look at my fireplace my fireplace is all jersey sandstone that's turning to iron as as the air gets to that stone it gets darker and darker and maybe in 50 years it'll be iron because it it, it really it turns into iron so here we got the 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 iron cedar on on that side and on the south side of the Mullica River, we called it muck cedar because on the south side of Mullica River, the ground was richer in topsoil. And I don't know why, it just, it's kind of like a dividing line. But I can literally taste a piece of cedar and, ta and taste the iron content in it and the amount of acid it has in it and say, this is from the north side. That's from the south side. So the professors who wrote books about Atlantic White Cedar probably can't do that. Probably can't. Probably Mr. Can't. Farrell, he's the he's your uh, Stu Farrell. Stu Farrell is mm -hmm. your professor out there. Ah, oh, him and I have had many arguments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway, well, learning I versus experience. I love I love the Atlantic White Cedar tree. It 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 was it was so unique. Uh, I take it and I meet the decoy carvers who come here to get the cedar slabs. Now, when you chop a tree down, it has a very large bell bottom. And when you put it in the, the saw to cut the saw, that bell bottom, sometimes the wood would be four to six inches thick. And it's perfectly curved and it's sap wood. It doesn't have a lot of rosin in it. The rosin, uh, the rosin in the center of the tree holds it up, but the, the outside of the tree is where all the life is. If you, the Indians did this to clear land, guess how they cleared land? They went in and they had sharp stones and they would take and they would slice the bark all around the tree. And they'd go over to the next tree and they'd slice all around the thing. And they'd go to, they would do that to all these trees 
and five years, there's a clearing there. All those trees are dead. It's all over, and they're great for firewood. The Indians are vagabonds. You know, they move from one area to another. They never stay in one place because of human waste and things like that. You can imagine what it's like to live in the woods or live off the land, totally off the land. So they're moving. So they're, it's called garroting. They garroted the trees and, and take the bark off and the tree would die. So that's another way of, of harvesting trees. The Indians were really smart. And they, of course, used the poles for, for uh, teepees. Most of the Lenape Lenapes made a tree with bent over cedars and tied them with, with the sinews from deer. The, you know why a deer can jump so high and so far? There's a sinew in its back leg. It's about that wide and it's about that long. And it made a wonderful tie in string. Hmm. So they always, that was a very unique thing. They take their sinews and they would tie these, stick them in the ground, tie them together, and then they would weave uh, stuff into them. They have a name, but I forget what they were called. But you can look them up. But the, but the, the bows were made from cedar because it would bend really nice. Or they could use oak or birch or anything. Uh, you've got... You've got a, an unbelievable amount of forest, uh, the different trees that grow in the area. We've got white oak, red oak, black oak, pin oak, white cedar, red cedar, maple, swamp maple, gum, sour gum, sweet gum. There's so many different kinds of trees in South Jersey. It's unbelievable. It's beautiful. The forest, when you walk through a forest, you know, you, you can see the, the variety of trees that grow here. But boy, nothing was as valuable as that Atlantic white cedar because it meant so much. It meant so much to the economy of a growing America. They could uh, build ships here. Every, every shipyard that I can think of, and I'm going to send Tom some pictures of the Van Zandt shipyard. I will, I will send it to you, and, and you can uh, uh, print it out for, these, Good. for your students. Good. It's the Van Zandt shipyard. And they're, they're putting four fantail two-masted schooners together right here in Port Republic. And it was taken, it was, the picture was taken off of a glass negative uh, right around the time of the Civil War. Well, I can tell you almost exactly within two years how old the picture is because my grandmother is standing there as a little 12-year-old or 10 or 12-year-old girl on one of these boats. She's in the dark dress. So when you get this picture, that's my grandmother. Laura Van Zandt. Gary, you've um, given us a, a really lovely description of the use cycle of cedar, but you haven't talked much about what you did for most of your life um, as a woodworker and a carver. Can you uh, perhaps, maybe this is our, our wind up here, could you talk about carving with cedar or Absolutely. working with cedar? I, I started to get into it, Tom, about the uh, the the bell bottom shape of the tree that great big thick slab and you've got a slab that's maybe 12 14 foot long and you've got this great big butt on it well grandpa had a real sharp little axe there probably a plumb axe but he could handle with one hand and he'd chop into it and chop into it and cut that thick butt off and throw it under the carriage well there was all, always 20 or 30 pieces of this real thick cedar who came there to get the cedar the decoy makers okay the okay. decoy makers and I'm going to get up for a minute and I'm going to show you one of an early decoy. This is, this is a broad bill decoy. Uh, it's a, the correct name for this duck is a scalp, but we called them broad bills because they had a very wide bill or blue bills. It was usually a little blue. This is a Harry Van Nuxen broad bill decoy in original paint has the original leather strap on it and this is all original paint even the eyes he painted this eye with a four penny nail he dipped it in the in the yellow yellow paint hmm. and he would blot it one two three four five and then the sixth one was right where he wanted it to go and he turned the decoy over and he one two three four five blot it put it there and then he had a little two-penny finish nail that he did the same thing and put the black spot in it. Hmm. This is an unbelievable decoy because it has that original eye in it. 
this de this decoy is worth about six thousand dollars. That's how collectible they became. But you can see by the curve in this, if you could, if there was no paint on this, you could see that this is almost uh, pretty much flat. These decoys were made from cedar slabs. So the cedar slabs are under that carriage. Mm -hmm. And Grandpop, he, uh, Grandpop has uh, all the cedar saved for these decoy makers. And I got to meet uh, John Updike, who was uh, in the 40s. He came and got the, the thing. So I'm influenced by Updike. So we were, we're gunning, we're gunning the Malka River with Daddy. We, we came in, we usually hunt in the morning and then late at night. You know, during the day, the ducks didn't fly too much. So we left the boat there. We took our, we took our guns and brought our guns home, but we left the decoys on the back of the sneak box. Well, somebody come up and liked them more than we did and we lost our decoys off the back of the sneak box. So uh, within the middle of the season, so my father goes over to Marine Mart. It was a store on Maryland, I forget the name of the other street, but it was near Maryland Avenue in Atlantic City. Marine Mart store. When you walked into these stores, all you could smell was steam tar. They steam tarred all the codfish line, the fish line. They steam tarred all the ropes and everything. When you opened the door to the Marine Mart, wham, that smell hit you. And when I say Marine Mart, I can smell it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I wish... I had a great big line, uh, a great big spool of codfish line, and I used to let everybody smell it. But it got so old, it lost its smell. Mm -hmm. But so he goes into Marine Mart and brings back a dozen decoys that were made by J. W. Bowen, who lived in Atlantic City. Well, they had great big long bodies about that long, and they had heads about that long, and heads that were about that high. And I saw these. I said, Daddy. They're going to scare more ducks than they're going to attract them. They are awful. He said, well, if you think you can do better, why don't you get together with your grandpa across the street? He knows how to make decoys. Mm -hmm. He said, get your grandpa to show you how to make mm -hmm. them. So I could draw. I always drew. All during, all during the World War II, I drew nothing but airplanes. I can still draw a P-47 from memory, a P-38 Lightning with the twin tails, B-29s. And I can draw them from memory because I drew so many of them. So I could draw duck heads and I sketched them out. Grandpa had a bandsaw and we cut them out. And uh, I, I learned, learned how to carve them. And, and uh, meeting Mr. Updike, he kind of took me under his wing and showed me a couple of things. Grandpa used a rasp to shape his decoys. Uh, I, I like to use a spoke shave and a, uh, and a draw knife, you know, with a schnitzel bunk. And, uh, it's really unique. So I start carving ducks and had a load on the sneak box. And there was a state police captain. His name was uh, Smith, Captain Smith. And he gunned with Gus Hickman, who lived down on the corner here. Uh, Gus Hickman had a gas station, a Sunnico gas station in Port. And all the fishermen used to go in there and drink sodas and smoke cigarettes and shoot darts. And tell tell lies and stories about how many ducks they killed or how many fish they caught. Mm -hmm. You know, just a neat place for a kid to hang up and listen to these stories. So, uh, it was it was all fun. And and this Captain Smith saw the decoys and he said, "Where'd you get them?" And I said, "I made them." He said, "What would you charge to make a dozen for me?" And I said, uh, "I thought you know for a minute." I said, "Wow, you know this guy wants to buy some. You know I can make some." So I told him I said thirty six dollars a dozen. He said that's good. I think Updike was getting three dollars a dozen or something like that, and I thought my decoys were better than him, so I put an extra fifty cents on. So I made a dozen <coughs> decoys for Captain Smith, and they they were uh, I think there were eight black ducks, and four mallards, and two mallard hens, and two mallard drakes, and uh, and I made him an extra one. I made him a little grebe, like a baker's dozen. Okay. And I made him a little grebe. Well, he was so proud of that rig. He said, I don't know whether to uh, float these on the water or put them on the mantle. He said, they're just really beautiful here. And that just launched my career. And how old were you when you... 12 years it? old, 1948. Yeah, yeah. 1948, yeah. I was 12. Yeah. And, and sold my first dozen decoys to a state police captain. I didn't make any professional until I really got into high school where, uh, where I could really, in wood shop, you know, I would... Mm -hmm. 
I would bring in great big cedar slabs and make Canada geese because they had a bandsaw that had 32-inch wheels on mm -hmm. it. And, man, I could put that 12-inch cedar slab in there and cut out Canada geese. And so my, my, my shop teacher finally said, you're going to have to make some square-inch furniture, Gary, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because I was making stool ducks in school. Mm -hmm. But I'd make them for the teachers instead of a B-plus, I got an A. I knew how to do that. Smart. <laughs> But anyway, so here we are, and the, and then I uh, we go to a decoy show at Smithville. This really launches my whole career as an artist and everything. We go to a decoy show uh, given by Fred and Ethel Noyes to all the local decoy carvers in the area. Uh, Harry Shorts was there. This this guy's grandson, uh, and uh, and Jamie Han was there, and and. Uh, a whole, a whole bunch of really neat carvers, and we put this show on. Well, I was setting my table up, and I had made two plumage decoys. A plumage decoy is a great big high decoy of a heron or an egret, and these were shot over by Victorian market hunters only for the feathers. Hmm. You know, they, they made rules and laws that you couldn't do this. But I love these, these uh, the idea of a, a plumage decoy. So I had two plumage decoys, and they're sticking up way up high on my table. Well, Mrs. Noyes sees them, and she comes over, and uh, she said, how much is this? And how much is that? And she said, oh, I can see I'm making you nervous. She said, uh, I I'll stay away till you get all set up, and then we'll talk. Okay, Mrs. Noyes, then we'll talk. So she comes over, and she said, first of all, you got to move everything off your table. I want you to go over there in the window where people can see your stuff from the road. Okay. And where the people walk by, they'll be more interested in And she had her favorite carver over there. I forget his name, but he was a politician from up North Jersey somewhere. She took his nameplate off, put on my table, put my nameplate on his table, and I moved everything over. So she said, have you got a price for me? And I said, yeah, 300 hours to buy them all. And she said, that's fine, that's fine. And I said, but I would like to keep one. And she said, uh, which one do you want to keep? And, and I pointed to this little black bird flower. It's around here someplace. But I, this little black bird flower, I, I really liked it. And I said, I'd like to keep that. Oh, I really especially like that. And I said, well, I said, you can have it. No, no, you, you can have it. I'm taking everything else. You can have that one, Gary. So she's, now, I've got everything on my table is sold. So I can't sell anything. So what I'm doing at my table as the show's progressing, I'm telling stories. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to you, just to mm -hmm. the people that, like I just talked to you about cedar, but I do it in the piney way. Like out there, onto it, you know, put that knife onto that wood there and get that green line and zip off she goes, zip off she goes. So I'm talking piney to these people, and she, she's sitting over there, sitting over there, she's listening and, and walking sideways so she can non suspiciously -suspic get close to me so I'll stop talking if I see her. So she's, she come over to me, and she nudges me, and she said, we're having the buffet uh, after, the, after, the, uh, after the show. We're, inviting, we're, we're having a nice uh, chicken buffet dinner for you, for all the carvers and everything. She said, uh, I want you to sit with me and Fred. Now I'm really worried because I don't know how to eat a chicken bone in front of Mrs. Noyes. You know, this woman's got this restaurant where governors and mm -hmm. stuff fly in and airplanes and helicopters. I've been invited to have lunch with her. So I go down there and uh, and have sat next to her. And I said, Mrs. Noyes, how do you eat uh, a chicken leg at a sit-down dinner? And she said, that's amazing, Gary. She said, it's very simple. You just pick up the chicken bone like this, and you take your fork, and you touch the chicken bone. As long as the, as long as the fork is touching the chicken, you can eat it with your fingers. She said, you can do the same thing with a lamb chop. Wow, I'm cool now, man. I'm chewing up on these chicken bones. So we, we finished the dinner, and she said, I would like to talk to you about, uh, she said, where do you work? And I said, I'm, uh, I'm a lineman for Lancy Electric Company. And she said, could you stop by tomorrow morning? I would like to talk to you. And I said, well, uh, what time do you get? No, she said, come around 9 o'clock. I said, oh, I can't. i got to report to work. She says, no, no. 
you come see me at nine o'clock. I'll mm-hmm. take care of everything. Mm-hmm. She called the president of the Atlantic City Electric Company and had me excused for the day. So here I am sitting in the office with her. She said, I heard you tell stories. I love your work. You've got to be a part of our Smithville. We want you to be a demonstrating craftsman. Uh, w- would you consider coming to Smithville? And I said, well, I could do it on weekends, but I'm on emergency restoration. If we get a pole hit and there's wires down on the ground, I got to go and I got to go quick. And she said, uh, we'll work a code. We'll have a code where we'll call for Mr. Johnson. It was Mr. Johnson. When they heard Mr. Johnson, that was somebody go over and and close Gary's shop up because he's got to leave there's a pole hit or something, mm-hmm. you know, an emergency. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we worked all, worked all that. So I'm, at, I'm there at Smithville talking to people and everything, and Fred comes over, you know, and he's sitting there. He just loves it. He's got all these little wooden nickels, and he's handing them to the kids, you know, go buy some penny candy and stuff, and Fred's sitting there. Well, he got so he knew that I, that I love uh, Jersey Devil Cocktails. Mm-hmm. which is Laird's Applejack made in Mount Holly, New Jersey, mm-hmm. where Samantha's from, and and uh, cranberry juice. And there's something else, a little bit of something else put in it. I forget what it is. But he would come around the corner whistling with a with a uh, Jersey Devil cocktail. That's what they would call Jersey Devil. And uh, they still make them at Smithville. You can get a Jersey Devil cocktail. But anyway, so after a couple Jersey Devil cocktails and meeting people the first thing i know here's a here's a uh, uh a news truck pulling up got all the antennas and all the cameras and everything on the top and it's Edie huggins from channel 10 wcau in philadelphia she said mr guyverson we've heard an awful lot about you uh could we interview you and i said absolutely god she's a beautiful woman Unbelievable! I'm just sitting there saying I'm so nervous. I won't be able to talk. This woman is so beautiful. What am I? I can't talk piney in front of her, you know. And all these cameras and they're rigging me up, you know, putting wires on me. I've never done anything like that before. But that was my first interview. And after that interview, more people came out of Philadelphia. More people came from all over New Jersey to see me. We saw you on TV. Blah blah blah. How much do you get for this? Well, I was making a lot of shorebird decoys and I was selling them. Uh, they were selling them out of the shop, which was right across from where I was demonstrating in the ship's chandler. And uh, so I had a very unique thing. And I got paid the day I delivered stuff because Mrs. Noyce didn't like to pay everybody on time. So, But I got paid on time. I would get a check and I would get her to sign it and I'd walk across the street and get the check cashed and put the money in my pocket. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm working at Smithville and everything, and things are going, going really good for me, you know. And, and it, it, uh, it, it just grew and grew and grew. And then Fred and Ethel Noyes, they, they uh, start the Noyes Museum. And uh, Nick, my wife Nikki and I helped uh, Fred Noyes get it off the ground and get an architect and build the building. And, and he had the largest decoy collection in the world at the time. Over 7,500 decoys. Wow. He had 800 shorebirds. Amazing wow. collection. And Nikki and I photographed every one of them with an 8x10 color picture. They were measured and uh, all the details put on the back of the, of the pictures and put into a file system. It was an amazing job. And, uh, and Fred really loved my wife Nikki and I. And then Ethel said, uh, come over. I want, to, I want you to be a part of uh, something very important. And this was Super Bowl Sunday, the 13th Super Bowl. I'll never forget it. And I'm sitting there waiting for the uh, Super Bowl to come on and, and the Philadelphia news station butts in and a uh, noted restaurateur, Ethel Noyes, dies of a massive heart attack. Well, we were just, I said, wow, that's, uh, I'm done, you know, I'm just, I'm just done, you know. And, and then Fred told Nikki and I, you know, after the funeral, uh, you know, you kids are going to help me build a museum. We're going to build more than a duck museum. We're going to build a beautiful art museum. And it just grew from there. But that's that's how Nikki and I got involved with the Noise Museum. We were very close with Fred and Ethel. I go over to Mrs. Noise. Ethel Noise made me who I am today. There's a book out called uh, uh, Judy Corder's book. Do you know the title of it? 
It's the it's all about Fred and Ethel. Uh, Fred, I don't remember, the, yeah. A book chronicle on Fred and Ethel, yeah. but the book also chronicles Gary Guyverson. Okay. Uh, my whole my whole life is in there, and what she did for me, the people that she introduced me to, she me, introduces me to uh, uh, Governor Brendan Byrne. Brendan Byrne commissions me to do a carving for Jimmy Carter. I mean, it was just amazing what happened to my career because of Ethel Noyes. And I got on television. I, I did guest appearances on Captain Noah's show and, and uh, send your pictures to dear old Captain Noah. It, was, it just, my career just took off like crazy. And then I get in the Noise Museum and in 1988 I start carving mostly these beautiful red-breasted mergansers. This, everybody wanted red-breasted mergansers. And this particular merganser has a leather comb. I would split the, he the back out, cut the back out, and insert leather, put wooden wedges in there, glue it all in, and then cut the wedges off. But this was a decoy that I made in 1988 at the Noise Museum. And I must have made over three or 400 pair of these beautiful mergansers. And here's the hen that matches that. But feel how light they are, they're all hollow. Yeah. And uh, just a, a unique career takes off, you know. And, and then uh, I, I start working. I, I left the electric company. They said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to carve ducks the rest of my life. They said, you're going to starve to death. I said, well, I'm getting $1,200 a pair for my carvings. These were $600 a piece. Mm -hmm. you, you're, uh, uh, I said, I'm, 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 I can make two pair a week. I'm making $2,400 a week. I can go fishing whenever I want to. I can do anything I want to. And I'm making 2,400 hours a week. I don't think I'm going to starve to death. And I became a full-time artist, thanks to Ethel Noyes. I left the Atlantic Sea Electric Company. I was there for 13 years. I was getting seniority enough to, you know, to have a supervisor's job and really make some good money. And the benefits of Atlantic Sea Electric, working for a huge company like that is amazing. But I could leave it all because of, because of what Ethel Noyes done for me. And to sort of bring this to a close here, Gary, this happened because of Ethel Noyes, this happened because of your talent, but this also happened because you were working with Cedar, right? Absolutely. It all come back to the Cedar. I could get it for free. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had Cedar to play with as a boy. The first thing I ever made, Tom, was a birdhouse. Grandpa and I, we cut up some weatherboards, you know, and he said, let's make some birdhouses. Well, I must have put 30 nails in one dog and one bird nail. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I just over-nailed it completely, mm -hmm. you know, and all. But when it, got to, when it got to getting into Grandpop's cedar that he had saved for John Updike, you know, to make uh, carvings for, right. and I love to draw, mm -hmm. and uh, I got to, can you reach behind you, grab that thing by the bolt? With that? Yeah, can you lift him? Yeah. Be careful, the talons are really sharp. I got to yeah. show you this because... You're all from Stockton. Yeah, I from carved Stockton. an osprey. Uh, this is an osprey carving that I have that sets on my boat. The talons are made from three-quarter inch PVC pipe. The bill is a real bill from a taxidermist supply. Hmm. I could not get this, any wood to make that sharp of a 90-degree curve in it. So I literally uh, put that in, the, the glass eyes and all. But he's flying... Uh, on my boat, and the Osprey is the official mascot of Stockton, and all the Stockton kids just love this, and I love to show it to them. But he's, that's one of my things, and he's all made out of cedar. Everything is cedar, except those talons and the glass eyes and the plastic bill. But I've been <coughs> so fortunate and so lucky. Every time I made, every time I made a piece, someone would see it and say. Make me one, make, make me one. one. Too. Yeah. You know, so and, and I had a free hand to be creative. I could do what I wanted to do and carve what I wanted to. But Tom, I always had the wood. Yeah. I had the wood. I've got wood out in my barn that's forty years old that I've saved forty years ago for carving. It's amazing. Gary, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -mm. And thank you. Uh, being being a wood carver is a blessing and a something that I'm really proud of, but it's just something that we can do, that I could do, that was inside of me, and other people brought it out of me. I love creative writing, and I had this story, and you found this story and published it for me. 
you made me a published art. We're hoping for a more. published author. We're hoping for more. There's one there called All About Cedar. Mm -hmm. And most of, most of everything that I've told your, your, your wonderful, uh, uh, I forget. These aren't just students there. These are my oral history interns. Interns is the word I couldn't yes. get out. Interns. Yes. I thank your interns for all their hard work because they went over all that spelling and everything. But thank you so much. I, I told Tommy put an exclamation point on my life when he published my story. And I just uh, am so proud uh, to be a part of uh, an oral history thing that's now uh, on record in Stockton University. We are too. May God are continue too. to bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Put this guy right up here. Mm -hmm.